getting a little bit more complicated here with our tissue types. Epithelial tissue. This is a tissue that we said lines surfaces, and they could be surfaces on the outside of the body or on the inside of the body. Epithelial tissue oftentimes is sort of anchored um, to whatever's just beneath it. It's anchored via connective tissue. So let's see here, epithelial tissue, um, since it's on surfaces, a lot of times it's exposed to like abrasions and just it, it tends to experience some damage more than other tissue types would. So because of that, um, one special thing about epithelial tissue is just how quickly it can renew itself. It's pretty much normal for epithelial tissue to be constantly being renewed. Some of the surface cells fall off and then they get replaced by new cells that come up from, from below. So there's this continual renewal that's going on. Epithelial tissue comes in a lot of different varieties and this is why I mentioned getting a little bit more complex. What are some of the varieties that we might see? So we can classify this type of tissue based on how many layers of cells there are and also what are the shape of the cells. Those are the two primary things we'll be looking at. If we're talking about just a single layer of cells, then we would call it simple epithelium. If we have multiple layers of cells stacked on top of each other, that would be called stratified epithelium. Uh, looking at the cell shapes, and we could have a few different possibilities. You could have really flattened cells. I'll show you some pictures of these in just a moment. Um, but flattened cells, those are called squamous cells. So we could have squamous simple epithelium, epithelium or simple squamous epithelium. Um, or we could have simple cuboidal epithelium. This is just saying that there's one layer of cells, but they are cuboidal. They sort of look like little cubes. They're as tall as they are long. Finally, we could also have columnar cells. And if you think of like, what is a column? Basically think of a rectangle. It's a, it's a cell that's taller than it is wide. So those are all possibilities. And then on top of that, epithelial tissue can have special modifications. We can have cells that are specialized to secrete things or cells that are specialized to um, have cilia, which allow movement, move in a coordinated fashion. So this can get really, really intricate. Uh, let me show you some pictures. Let's start with simple epithelium. I want to show you some pictures of these three possible cell shapes. So for simple epithelium, Starting on the left over here, if you look at the, the purple layer on top, that's rep representing the epithelial layer. This is simple epithelium. And see how flattened these cells are. They're kind of like squished down flat. The, this is a great example of squamous cells. Okay, so simple squamous epithelium. Um, this is great for allowing diffusion, really rapid diffusion, right? Um, imagine in your lungs. So if this is lining the surface of your lungs, um, what would be diffusing across here would be gases. We have to allow oxygen to diffuse into the tissues and carbon dioxide waste has to be able to diffuse out. So just the fact that that cell layer is so thin, it really helps to facilitate rapid diffusion of substances like gases. Coming over to the middle, um, if you look at these cell shapes here, we've got cells that are about as wide as they are tall. Um, looking at the cells lining these ducts. So here's one ring of cells. Here is another ring of cells. Um, so these are, this is a great example of cuboidal epithelium. And notice it's not on the outside surface of the body. This looks like maybe it's on an inside surface. Maybe it's lining some ducts. Um, I believe this is in the kidneys, if I remember correctly for this picture. But anyway, cuboidal epithelium, uh, very specialized for um, secreting things. A lot of times these cells will be secreting into the duct and then that duct would carry the fluids away. Okay, finally on the right here is an example of columnar epithelium. Still simple, okay? So a single layer of cells, but they are columnar in shape. So if you look, um, right, here is a cell. Here is another cell right next to it. Okay, so they're laid out sort of horizontal in this picture, but they're very long compared to how wide they are. All right, so simple columnar epithelium. What does this do? This is found in places that um, require a lot of absorption. For example, in the intestine, these cells would be great for absorbing things into themselves. Um, and then they could transport over to the other side and transport things into the bloodstream ultimately. 
Let's look at some stratified epithelial tissue in contrast, starting on the left over here. All right, all of these pink cells, see how layered they are. There are so many layers. Looking at the top, there's um, there are some layers that look pretty flattened. These look like they're squamous cells, but there are lots of layers stacked on top of each other. So this would be stratified. And then there's another word I'm going to introduce you to, keratinized versus non-keratinized. This is referring to whether keratin is present. Keratin is a protein fiber that's water resistant. This is something that can be housed in cells in order to give some sort of waterproofing. So the very top layer of your skin um, is composed of keratinized cells. They are actually dead cells. They're just packed with keratin. Let me come over to this image here. This is a cross section of skin. So epidermis, this is the very top layer of skin. All of these are keratinized cells. They are non-living. They're just packed with this keratin protein. So that helps to, to provide some waterproofing. And then underneath of that, um, in the deeper layers, we would have non-keratinized cells that are doing other things. So keratinized versus non-keratinized. Um, non-keratinized cells are living. Keratinized cells tend to be dead, and they're found on the very surface. So they, um, keratinized cells, they're providing a very protective surface, not only with waterproofing, but also just remember, abrasions are happening on the surface of your skin all the time. You brush up against something, probably some cells are gonna, gonna flake off in the process, and then um, ultimately the skin gets renewed from the lower layers. The cells just sort of push up as they divide and, and they replace themselves that way. So um, with regards to epithelial tissue, I'm going to put up a table here just to show uh, many different examples of epithelial tissue, lots of different types. I don't expect you to memorize this table, but what I would like for you to be able to do is come over, look at one of these names and understand what the name is telling you about it. So like this one right here, um, actually, let me go to the one below. This one right here, simple ciliated columnar epithelium. Okay, what does the word simple tell you? It means it's a single cell layer. What does the word ciliated tell you? We didn't go into this in a lot of detail, but that's telling you that these cells have cilia on them. So little hair-like projections. Uh, columnar, okay, that's telling you the shape of the cells. And then epithelium, this is telling you which tissue type we're talking about. So this is lining a surface of some sort. So lots of examples here. You can take a look, um, have an idea what the, what the function might be, right, based on the structure. And then we will, as we go throughout the semester, we'll be looking at lots of examples in different locations throughout the body. One last thing about epithelial tissue. We mentioned that it can be quite specialized. Okay, so let's talk about glands for just a moment. Epithelial tissue can be specialized to secrete. Um, glands secrete things. And we're going to be encountering two major types of glands in this class. I want to just introduce this word right now. Um, we'll be looking at this in more detail later on. Glands can be either endocrine glands or exocrine glands. So these two words are what I'd like you to focus on. Endocrine versus exocrine. What is the difference between these two gland types? Endocrine glands secrete sort of like internally. They don't secrete to the surface of the body. Instead, they secrete internally. So let's look at this picture here. All of these pink cells, these are the cells that are secreting. And once they secrete whatever substance they're making, um, where is it going to go? It doesn't have a direct pathway out to the sur surface of the body. Instead, it's just going to diffuse over to the nearest capillary and get taken up into the bloodstream. That's an example of endocrine, an endocrine gland. An exocrine gland, on the other hand, um, these cells that are secreting, they are secreting into this space and then there's a duct that leads out to the surface of the body. That's an exocrine gland. So for right now, what we're talking about are exocrine glands because we're dealing with epithelial tissue. Okay, so these cells that are lining the surface of the body, if they secrete things, then where is it gonna go? Well, it's gonna go out to the surface of the body. All right, so exocrine glands. Um, okay, yeah, they produce secretions that are carried by ducts. So this right here would be an example of a duct. 
And we've got lots of different examples of exocrine glands. Um, lacrimal, this is talking about tear glands near your eyes. Sweat glands, these are found throughout the body. Sebaceous glands, these are oil glands. Um, pretty much every hair has a sebaceous gland associated with it at its base. Digestive enzymes, so in the digestive tract, right? Where do enzymes come from? Well, they're secreted by epithelial cells in your digestive tract. And the prostate gland, we'll come back to this one when we talk about reproduction. I'd like to focus in on sweat glands for just a second. So sweat glands, um, again, they're found throughout your, throughout your skin. When you get hot, you start sweating, and that's all part of homeostasis, right? If your body temperature starts to get too high, then what's your body going to do? Your brain will ultimately detect that and cause your sweat glands to become activated. And uh, what's the purpose of that? Well, once your, once your sweat glands become activated, just the process of putting some fluid out on your skin, that's going to increase evaporation rate. And um, as evaporation happens, it will carry some heat away from your body. So it helps to bring your temperature back down. So that's maintaining homeostasis. That would be an example of thermoregulation. Okay, but um, one thing I wanted to mention about sweat glands is that we've got a couple of different types. There are eccrine sweat glands, and they do the job of thermoregulation. They secrete a salty solution. But we also actually have another type of sweat gland as well. We have apocrine sweat glands, and these are found just in specialized regions in the body. So the sweat that is produced in your underarm, for example, What's different about it? It has a smell, tends to have a smell, and that's not true of eccrine sweat. Um, so what's the big difference? It's actually a different type of sweat that's being produced. Um, the, the apocrine sweat glands produce a protein-rich fluid, and that's something that bacteria really like. So we tend to have populations of bacteria that live on our skin in these regions of our bodies. Um, so back, the bacteria that live in your underarms, they're actually the things that are making an odor. It's as they metabolize the protein, um, the bacteria are making the smell. So it's not you, it's the bacteria. Now you know. 